Hello! I don't know about you, but I'm feeling geeky today. And so today, I'd like to tell you about relational frame theory. It's new! It's exciting! Well, it's not that new. It started in the 70s with some research by a fellow named Sidman along uh, a line that became known as stimulus equivalence research. Now, I'm going to teach this really informally uh, in this crash course of relational frame theory for those who might be interested in this kind of abstruse stuff. But let me make this clear. I think that this is earth-shaking stuff. Really cool wrath of God stuff. Cats and dogs living together. All that kind of thing. So, now that we know how important I think relational frame theory is in a sort of loose and not particularly articulate way, let me tell you a little bit about stimulus equivalence. Now, this is a finding that my understanding is is only in humans, only in verbal humans, uh, about 16 to 18 months and up, and has been very, very difficult to demonstrate in animals, much more so than one might intuitively think. One might think one's dog understands what a ball is, but it turns out that animals may simply not understand what is, is, to sound a little, maybe Bill Clinton about it. So this is about what is, is, or how we learn to call things names. So, very briefly, we can teach just about anyone to have a sound associated with uh, some kind of stimulus. So we can say to a dog, outside, outside, and from the word outside and from my tone, the dog probably, um, well, definitely gets excited and, and jumps up and down and probably has some kind of experience of uh, outside. The stimuli of outside are associated with outside, outside. Um, but what doesn't happen, that there's no evidence whatsoever to show that if you present the stimuli of outside, say the nice yard, the nice yard, the nice uh, places for him to uh, pee on, uh, the interesting other dogs to sniff, and so forth, there is no evidence that the dog then has uh, an experience of the sound outside, outside. So that outside, outside points to this experience of outside. But this experience of outside does not spontaneously point to uh, the sound. Okay, let's make that a little clearer, all right? Uh, I can teach you something. I can teach you that this object has a name, and its name is Funt. Okay? So we see this, and then we hear Funt. See Funt? Hear Funt. See this thing? Hear Funt. Okay. Now what's this? And everybody says, it's a Funt. Okay. Now here's what happens with human beings. They see this, and then they hear foot. Now, spontaneously, what happens? Again, see this, hear foot. See this, hear foot. Okay, now what happens is we get an extra derived relation. Hear foot and see this. So I, I may never have trained you to do that. In fact, I didn't. Uh, but when you hear foon, now you have this picture come into your mind. Now that's so obvious that that should be so. And yet it's been extraordinarily difficult to demonstrate that in any uh, individuals, any uh, organisms other than verbal humans. Uh, normally developing healthy humans uh, older than 16 to 18 months. Now, how did we get to the point that we spontaneously derived uh, the relation between B and A, given the relation between A and B? So again, A, whatever it is, this thing, see this thing, here, hand. See this thing, here, hand. Okay, and then we spontaneously derive from that, here, hand. And then in our minds, we see this thing. And that's what something 
that's what be, something being called something is. That's what is is. And that's the first relational frame we learn, which formally is called the relational frame of correspondence. The relational frame of correspondence. It's the meaning of the word is. Well, so how do we uh, learn that? Uh, this is not proven, but what we suspect strongly is through multiple exemplars. So a child might hear, where's the cup? Where's the cup? And they look around and they see something like this. And when they orient toward it, the mama says, oh, yeah, you see the cup. Okay. And then, uh, you know, where's glasses? Where's the glasses? Where's the glasses? And then they see the glasses. Okay. And then this gets turned around. So someone says, what's this? What's this? It's a cup! So now it's turned around. Instead of here cup, see cup, now we have see cup and then here cup. Where's, uh, what's this? What's this? It's glasses! And the child doesn't have to say glasses. Uh, and yet this repetition uh, seems to eventually generalize so that the child learns something that if they uh, hear a sound and then are presented with an object, then probably the way it's going to work is that when they're presented with the object, they should hear the sound. So they're taught uh, through multiple, ex we are taught through multiple exemplars to make this generalization to the point that if we take a nonsense word, or let's say a meaningless symbol like this, and we're told this is a font, we will spontaneously derive, without having been taught, that, whoops, not the thank you note, the word foont has something to do with this shape. So that is stimulus equivalence, the first relational frame, presumably, that we learn developmentally, and the most basic. X is Y, therefore Y is X. X is equivalent to Y, implies that y is equivalent to x. We get two relations for the price of one. We only teach one, the other is derived. Now it turns out that you can go further than this. Uh, so um, with equivalence you could learn a third relation, um, well excuse me, a third, you could have a third term and learn a second relation. So the first relation you were taught is that this is a foon. And the second taught relation is that uh, a foot goes whee! Okay? So this is a foot, is the first relation taught, and a foot goes whee! is the second relation. So we have two taught relations. Now this is easier to show on paper. So we have uh, this funny thing, which I will approximate its shape with this drawing here, and we have uh, the word foont, which we've now uh, been taught has something to do with this. So we're taught one relation here that this has to do with foont. Okay? And then we're also taught that a foont goes wee. And that's the second relation that we're taught. There's the first one, and there's the second one, here. Um, and from this, we derive four relations. Four relations are derived for the price of, well, total of six are learned for the price of two. Two that are taught and four that are derived. What are the four that are derived? Well, not only that this has to do with foont, but that foont has to do with this, which we've already talked about. So, um that relation. Then we der derive that whee! Not only does foont have to do with whee, but if we say what goes whee, you would probably say, well, a foont. And so then we get um, this free relation, this derived relation. And then finally, if we would say point to the thing that goes whee, you'd probably point to, to this weird thing. And uh, so then there's this other derived relation. 
And then if we said, what sound does this make? You could produce the sound, whee! And so we have this derived relation. And here we see how these derived stimulus relations can add up really quickly. We only taught two. We only taught that um, uh, this is a foont and that a foont goes, uh, and, and that this goes, whee! May have uh, gotten a little sloppy there, but I think you get the idea. I'm going to take this to here, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about other relational frames and why we should even care about this stuff. Presumably, if you're watching, you're probably a psychotherapist or someone interested in ACT, so I'm going to continue gearing the discussion in that direction. Talk to you soon.